the minimum wage, the ban on cluster bombs, the cancelling of death, the trebling of aid, the first ever climate change act. What's up, everybody? I'm Finn McKenty. This is the Punk Rock NBA. And what comes to mind for you when I say the word indie? For me, it used to mean bands like Fugazi, the Pixies, or the Smiths. Bands that all got their start operating kind of outside the mainstream music industry, playing music that was too raw or too weird for most people to handle, grinding it out on these tiny labels, maybe even releasing their own music, and touring around the country playing grimy, hole-in-the-wall kind of venues. But now the word indie means something very different from that. It doesn't necessarily mean artists that are actually independent at all, because now we have artists who are considered indie, even though they're on major labels. And there are plenty of examples, like the time that Grizzly Bear was in a Volkswagen Super Bowl commercial. With 13 different models, it's a whole new Volkswagen and a whole new game. Or Tegan and Sarah in an Oreos commercial. And just to be clear, I have absolutely nothing against any artist who takes the opportunity to get a payday because I totally understand and I completely support that. My point is just that clearly something has changed about the definition of indie because now I think it's an aesthetic more than anything else. It doesn't necessarily mean that an artist is actually independent. It's more like a sound, a genre of music, it's fashion. It's really a lifestyle. When I think of indie, I think of the kind of people who go to that trendy new brunch spot that has bottom mimosas on Sunday mornings. And I'm not here to criticize that. My question is just, how did we get here? How did we get from Fugazi to the Lumineers? How did indie go from this underground DIY movement inspired by punk to now being the soundtrack for car commercials? And is that even a bad thing? Those are the questions that I will answer in this video. But first, have you ever tried Googling yourself? Name, address, phone number? Honestly, it's kind of scary what personal information about us is out there. And that information is out there because of people called data brokers who profit by selling your information to robocallers, telemarketers, and spammers. And that is why I'm excited to tell you about today's sponsor, Aura. Aura can identify data brokers who are exposing your information and submit opt-out requests on your behalf. Brokers are legally obligated to remove your information if you ask them to, but of course, they make it super hard to do on your own. So why not let Aura handle it for you? Aura also does so much more to protect you and your family from online threats that you may not even know about. It's really easy to set up so you don't have to download separate apps to get things like parental controls, VPN, antivirus, password management, identity theft insurance, and more. You get everything at one affordable price. You can either let people continue to exploit and profit off of your private information, or you can go to aura.com slash punk rock to start your two week free trial. That link is in the description of this video, or you can just scan the QR code on your screen right now. And to answer those questions, I'm gonna go back to the very beginning or at least close to it. Independent music has existed forever, but the roots of what we would call indie now go back to the punk scene of the late 70s and early 80s. Some people credit the Buzzcocks as being kind of the first band to blaze that trail with the release of their 1977 EP, Spiral Scratch. Hey, yeah, well, I There was also Black Flag, who came out in 1977 on their own label, SST Records, and kind of created a lot of the blueprint for DIY touring as we know it. But who did it first doesn't really matter. The point is that there were all these bands that decided that rather than try to cooperate or compromise with the mainstream music machine and sign to some record label that wanted them to change their music into something more accessible, they decided that they would do it all themselves. They started their own labels, they booked their own tours, and they decided that they would do it all themselves, their own way, independently. And on the back of all of that, inspired by what the punk bands were doing, there were other scenes that sort of took that blueprint and put their own spin on it. From post-punk like The Smiths to early goth like The Cure and Bauhaus. Noise rock like Sonic Youth. 
And for the context of this video, maybe most significantly the indie pop scene that sort of simultaneously sprouted up in all these different corners of the planet. With the big ones being New Zealand, Glasgow, Scotland, and Olympia, Washington, with bands like Beat Happening and the Verlaines, among many others. But what many people credit as being sort of the landmark moment of this era was the release of the C86 compilation by the British magazine NME in 1986, which documented 22 of the UK's most interesting independent bands, for example, The Wedding Present and Primal Scream. As one journalist later said, it was the beginning of indie music. It's hard to remember how underground guitar music and fanzines were in the mid 80s. DIY ethics and any residual punk attitudes were in isolated pockets around the country and the C86 comp and gigs brought them together. And by the late 80s, the so-called college rock scene was starting to get some serious attention from the mainstream music industry. Bands like the B-52s, R.E.M., and the Pixies had all signed to major labels. They started getting played on radio, and MTV even created a show called 120 Minutes, which was specifically dedicated to alternative music. And very much like punk, the college rock scene, at least in the beginning, was also this underground DIY scene that deliberately operated outside the major label mainstream music system. But it didn't have the aggressive, sometimes violent culture of early punk and hardcore. And sonically, it really wasn't that far removed from mainstream rock. It was much more accessible than Black Flag or even early Husker Du, but still edgier than the truly mainstream rock of the time, like, say, Hollow Notes or Kenny Loggins. And I'm sure there were some people at the time complaining about these once underground bands now getting mainstream exposure. But to me, it doesn't feel like it was getting exploited in any kind of like gross, overly commercial way. It felt like the mainstream came to them, not the other way around. But still, these were supposedly indie bands that were now on major labels and MTV, which kind of raises the question of what does indie even mean? The website 23indie has a pretty great definition that I think I'm gonna borrow here. They break indie down into three parts. Number one is a music publishing model, meaning not on a major label. Number two is a state of mind or an attitude, meaning kind of unconventional and I guess somewhat difficult for a mainstream audience to digest. And number three, a style of music, meaning that if you sound like an indie artist, then you are an indie artist, regardless of whether you are actually independent or not. And basically, I think this whole conversation or debate, to the extent that it is a debate, really centers around that definition. My personal view is that indie was originally all three of those things. It was a music publishing model that went hand in hand with an attitude and a style of music. Bands like Fugazi, The Buzzcocks, and Beat Happening started their own labels and released their own music, in large part because the mainstream music industry either didn't care about them or wanted them to change their music and become more accessible. And so instead of playing that game, those bands just said, you know what, fuck you, we don't need you, we don't want you, we're gonna do this all ourselves independently. But over time, the definition of indie has de-emphasized those first two things and shifted more towards being just style. It became just another genre label and an aesthetic. And how exactly did that happen? How did we go from Fugazi to the Lumineers? Well, that brings me to probably the biggest inflection point in this whole story, which was the grunge explosion of the 90s. Right here, the second of tonight's two world premiere videos. It's from the Seattle band Nirvana and their second album, Nevermind. Here's the planet's first look at Smells Like Teen Spirit. And you've heard the story a million times before, right? Everybody says that Smells Like Teen Spirit by Nirvana came out in 1991 and everything changed overnight. And I was there, I grew up in the Seattle area at the time, and I can tell you that is 100% accurate. After they blew up along with the other Seattle bands like Soundgarden, Alice in Chains, and Pearl Jam, everybody wanted to be quote unquote alternative, which on the one hand was obviously a little bit cringe, but on the positive side, it also brought a ton of attention to anything even tangentially related to grunge. And one of those things was indie music because it had very close ties to grunge. 
For example, if you've ever seen Kurt Cobain's little K tattoo, that is the logo for K Records in Olympia, Washington. One of the definitive American indie labels that put out artists like Beck, Modest Mouse, and Bikini Kill. MTV's 120 Minutes also got this huge influx of new viewers who wanted to find out more about this alternative indie rock thing that was cool now. And from that show, they found out about bands like the Pixies, Stone Roses, the Sundays, the Violent Femmes, and so forth. 120 Minutes did so well, and alternative music in general was so popular that MTV even created a daily highlight show called Alternative Nation that was kind of like TRL for grunge. There's nothing like Manhattan's Lower East Side. And the music that comes from there, it's as good as uh, the sweat from the Christ child's brow. And alternative and indie aren't exactly the same thing, but there's certainly a lot of overlap. And the net effect of grunge and alternative blowing up was that what felt like kind of a secret society just a few years ago was now the mainstream. My favorite example of how ridiculously commercialized it got was when Kmart started selling pre-made grunge outfits. And so for better or worse, the 90s were really the opening of the floodgates for when indie started to move away from being actually independent and more towards an attitude and a sound and an aesthetic as it became just another product for major labels, clothing retailers, and the media to sell. And then put, you know, in the caption below, flannel shirt, $85. Which brings us to the next big inflection point, the early to mid 2000s. Blink-182, Green Day 75, these names are not cool. What's in now is the. The first big moment here was the explosion of the the bands, like the Hives, the Vines, the White Stripes, which blew up when the Strokes debut album, This Is It, came out in 2001, and quickly made that sort of stripped down garage rock, Velvet Underground kind of sound the next big thing. Yeah. And like grunge, those bands weren't necessarily indie in the purest sense of the word, but they were definitely indie adjacent, meaning that it was a short jump from a kid hearing like the strokes of the white stripes on MTV or rock radio to then checking out something like Bell and Sebastian. And one of the really interesting things to me is that almost overnight, these songs started popping up in all these huge commercials. For example, Are You Gonna Be My Girl by Jet in those iconic iPod commercials with the dancing silhouettes. or Modest Mouse in the OnStar Navigation commercial. Looks like our check engine light's on. Can you do a diagnostic check for us? Everything's fine. Oh, but you've got to lose gas cap. And there's kind of two obvious questions here. First of all, how did this happen? And the answer to that one, I think, is pretty simple, which is that, to put it bluntly, commercials are primarily made by artsy white people, which is the exact demographic that all that stuff appealed to. So when the people making those commercials had the chance to sneak one of their favorite bands into a commercial, they did it. And to be clear, I don't see anything wrong with that, although it did literally commercialize the genre. Get one free year of unlimited music when you sign up for wireless service. Mobile music from the new AT&T. Your world delivered. And the second question is, was it selling out for these bands to license their music for OnStar and Oreo commercials? And the answer to that gets back to the question of what is indie? If you think that indie means telling the music industry to fuck off, well, then I would say, yes, it is selling out by that definition. Like if the Dead Kennedys took a million dollars to use Holiday in Cambodia in a George Bush campaign ad. Obviously, that would be going against everything the band stands for. But I don't think that's how any of these bands saw things. They were all on major labels, and as far as I'm aware, they never claimed to be anti-establishment or indie or punk or anything like that. To the extent that any of them were indie at all, I think it really goes to the third part of that definition I talked about earlier. This was just a style of music to them that didn't necessarily go hand in hand with the culture and values of early indie. So if Apple or Ford or Totino's Pizza Rolls or whatever wants to give them a bunch of money to use their song in a commercial, well, why wouldn't they do it? And why shouldn't they? For example, when the Shins licensed one of their songs for a somewhat notorious commercial for McDonald's. There will be a first step a first word, and of course, a first french fry. When asked about it later, the Shins frontman James Mercer said that he actually did regret it a little bit because they did get some backlash from their fans, but their rationale for doing it in the first place was because, as he said, we got paid good money to do it and we knew it was not cool. We knew it wasn't like a punk rock thing, but I was kind of anti-punk rock. 
And so the fact that somebody in a so-called indie band would say yes to doing a McDonald's commercial, specifically because they were anti-punk rock, I think says a lot about how the definition of indie had changed even by that point in time. But if I had to point to one specific moment where indie became something that was, well, not very independent, it would be the mid 2000s when it seemed like indie was the new grunge and every corporation on earth was trying to cash in. There were movies like Garden State with the infamous Natalie Portman scene that probably created an entire generation of Shins fans. What are you listening to? The Shins, you know them? Or a few years later, 500 Days of Summer, where another quirky indie girl with bangs reveals that she loves indie music. I love the Smiths. Sorry. I said I love the Smiths. But probably the biggest example of how commercialized indie had become was the teen drama The O.C., which ran from 2003 to 2007. And for the record, I love this show. My wife and I just rewatched it, and the first two seasons are great. California, here we come, right back where we started to make a long story short, the show was about a bunch of rich teenagers from Laguna Beach. And as the show's music supervisor said years later, the music wasn't just the background, it was intended to be a character on the show. And that music was almost exclusively indie rock. For example, one of the main characters is this kind of lovable nerd named Seth Cohen, who loved indie music and dropped all these like very heavy handed references to bands like Death Cab. God, this is a nightmare. I'm sweating to death, driving 10 miles an hour. I'm like a rickshaw listening to this music. Hey, do not insult Death Cab. It's like one guitar and a whole lot of complaints. The show's theme songs by Phantom Planet, The Walkmen, The Killers, and Modest Mouse, among other bands, all played live at a venue on the show called The Bait Shop. Yo, oh, The Killers. Awesome, huh? Beck and Coldplay debuted music on the show. They even did a six volume compilation album series called Music from the OC. And this wasn't just some show. It was the most popular show that year with teenagers, with over 10 million people tuning into some of the episodes. And I guarantee you that if you asked a lot of 30 something indie fans now, if they were being honest with you, they would tell you that Seth Cohen was their musical tastemaker back then and probably influenced a lot of the things that they still listen to to this day. But it wasn't just that show. Everybody was trying to get rich off of indie culture. American Apparel, which started in 1989, had grown into one of the biggest North American apparel manufacturers by the mid 2000s, with dozens of stores near college campuses all over the country, staffed by the most hipster hipsters to ever hipster, and eventually going public in 2006 with a valuation of over $380 million. Urban Outfitters was also on fire at the time. Pabst Blue Ribbon actually outsold Coors for a little while. Walmart started selling Fixies. It all reminded me of how absurdly commercialized grunge had gotten in the mid 90s. But unlike grunge, there wasn't really an indie crash. Maybe it wasn't like necessarily the hottest thing in pop culture anymore, but there wasn't any real obvious bursting of the bubble where something new came along and indie wasn't cool anymore. By the 2010s, Coachella became the premier event for trendy young people to go to. Vice had become a multi-billion dollar company. And the hipster aesthetic, along with major label indie bands like the Lumineers, became kind of the default for trendy restaurants and coffee shops all over the planet. Basically, indie had become the look and sound of the upper middle class yuppie lifestyle. Which brings me to the last question, is that such a bad thing? Sure, on the one hand, you can say that the DIY anti-establishment ethics of the original indie movement are essentially gone now. And given the roots of the genre, maybe it's a little bit cringe to see a so-called indie band in a Taco Bell commercial. No matter how hard you try, pictures just don't do it justice. The Doritos Locos Tacos. Taking tacos where no one thought they'd go. But on the other hand, can any of us say that we would turn it down if we had the chance? I mean, I have a channel with punk rock in the name, and I've done sponsorships with everything from underwear to deodorant to mobile games, because I figure, you know, this probably won't last forever, and I have a family to take care of. And so I really can't fault any of these bands for taking the money when they get the opportunity. And as for making indie culture mainstream and sort of watering it down, well, that's just the story of every subculture. I've watched it happen with pretty much everything I was into as a kid, from graffiti to skateboarding to punk. And although, yes, that does always have some awkward moments when you bring people in that don't necessarily get it. But at the end of the day, I love all those things and I want as many people as possible to experience them. So did Seth Cohen kill indie rock? Maybe, maybe he did. But the OC was a great show, so I consider that a fair trade.
All right, my friends, that does it for this video. As always, let me know what you think in the comments. And I want to thank everyone who supports me on Patreon, especially those of you who support at the True Cult level or above. Patrons get all my videos and podcasts early. There are members only channels in my Discord that I'm super active in. I do giveaways. There's even a way to have me review your music or artwork. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, hit the link in the description of this video. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now, but I will see you next time.